Hello and welcome to this online fireside chat organized by the Financial Express. My name is Mukund Rajan and I'm delighted to bring you the next edition in a series of important conversations arranged by the Financial Express with key influencers in India on the ESG imperative. My book, Outlast, How ESG Can Benefit Your Business, argues that a focus on ESG can help businesses to build resilience, gain competitive advantage, and achieve greater returns in the long run. My guest today is Meher Padamji, the chairperson of Thermax. And in conversation with her, I'm looking forward to getting her perspective on the ESG imperative. Thermax, of course, is well known for a wide range of engineering solutions it offers across sectors, including energy, environment, and chemicals, both in India and overseas. Thermax is expected to be a big beneficiary of the increasing focus of corporate India on ESG, with offerings and spaces like waste heat recovery, waste to energy, biomass plants, flue gas desulfurization, and water treatment, and the list goes on. So welcome, Meher. Great to have you. you on the show. Thank you very much, Mukun. So let me start by asking you, Mayor, why do you think there is so much more interest of late in environment, social and governance or ESG? So I think, first of all, um, E, S and G are being clubbed together. Um, but if you ask me, I think the one that is really getting the most focus today is the E, the environmental aspect. And um, I think as industry, we've always looked sort of internally in terms of how to become more efficient, how to become more profitable, how to look at shareholder value. I think for the first time, we are in some ways being asked as to how we are going to be responsible citizens of the world. So it's just not an internal focus, but an external focus on all stakeholders, including the planet including society. Uh, so it's a shift in mindset. It's a shift, I think, right from the top of an organization percolating downwards and along its entire ecosystem. Um, and I think the focus on E is so strong today, perhaps because investors, pension funds, uh, credit rating agencies, uh, all these people, are, uh, are in some ways pulling or demanding that we actually look at the environment. Um, also, let's face it, today with technologies advancing, um, return on investment for environment-related products and services has become that much more beneficial to companies. And so with this huge pull or this huge demand, I think, the E part of ESG is coming into focus. It's sad, but I think the S and the G still needs, it has a long way to go. And, um, and, and maybe we can talk about it later, but, uh, but even, even on the environment side, of course, today we are looking at the next five, 10, 15, 20 years, perhaps. But I think India is going to be one of the biggest, um, we'll have the biggest impact as far as environment is concerned. We have such a huge coastline and therefore things like really, really huge risks, like say migration of people. I don't think we're really thinking about it. You know, how is it really going to impact society? How is it going to impact industry? Uh, these are things that, that perhaps are some time away, but even on the E side, these are things that we need to really think about. Thank you. I think that is very eloquently put and uh, you're highlighting the fact that this is going to become an even more important agenda going forward. And on the social side, I think we have a question that's coming up for you on that. But before I go to that, one of the big changes we're going to see from this fiscal in India is, of course, the new business responsibility and sustainability reporting requirement, which SEBI, the public markets regulator, has mandated the top thousand listed companies uh, to develop and create. What impact do you think this is going to have on corporate India's ESG agenda? 
Yeah, I think first of all, bringing in a uniform code like BRSR is a good thing. Uh, in the sense, it will bring some measurable indicators where everyone then will look will be looked at like on the same page. Yeah, so that's a good thing. Uh, of course, there are some 103 disclosures. Uh, so pulling that all together uh, will probably be quite a Herculean task for companies. Uh, but I think, I think it's uh, a good thing. I remember when CSR started uh, so many years ago, um, I, was, I was really not for it because I said you can't mandate people to be socially responsible. It has to come from the heart. Um, but I, I am really happy to see that initially, perhaps it was a lot of tick marking, but I think today, genuinely, companies and people, many, many companies are looking genuinely at CSR um, and not just as a tick mark, but making a difference to society. So I think like that, perhaps BRSR will come in initially as a tick mark, uh, but I think if people genuinely go in with some of the questions, and I was looking at some of the questions of BRSR, I mean, they talked about slavery processes or slavery policies, uh, a disclosure on modern slavery process. And I thought to myself, I mean, how stupid this doesn't even apply to us, to, to people in India. And then you think of uh, how many people do we employ maybe through our third party contractors on minimum wage, less than minimum wages, working more than eight hours a day, uh, not having the ability to speak or complain about it, they are bonded labor. So in some ways, if you would redefine the word slavery as bonded labor, perhaps it just sets us thinking about, do we really have that within our larger ecosystem. You know, if we, we also need to, in some ways, define what we mean by employees. Uh, if we define it purely as people who are on our payroll, then one set of measures will come out. But if you define it far more broadly mm. to the whole ecosystem where we can influence some practices, um, then I think we'll find very, very different measures. So, so I, think, I think overall, I think BRSR is a very good thing. Uh, I also believe that, you know, when IFRS started uh, many, 25 years ago overseas, and India adopted it 10 years ago as INDIAS, um, I believe IFRS have also come up with international sustainability standards. They've come up with a draft. So possibly BRSR is a start in the right direction, but over a period of time, I can see us probably moving to these international sustainability standards. Quite right. I, I think that is the intended direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully there will be convergence that we will see across standards across yeah. countries. Yeah, yeah that, that's sorry, that's another thing. I hope we have one standard for the whole world, <laughs> you know, because I mean, having this GRI, then IR, now BRSR, then integrated sustainable standards. I mean, then you in your annual report, you have your MDA, you have your director's report. I mean, it's it's really quite a hodgepodge of many things. So I really hope we have just one that integrates it all such that investors and whoever, whichever stakeholder wants to look at an organization, you can pick up any annual report and really look at it, you know? Quite right. And I think as an international company, you're obviously subjected to these requirements in each yeah. jurisdiction. Absolutely. which can make life quite complicated. Thank you. Um, my next question is actually related again to the public markets and the role particularly of large institutional investors. So in India, the insurance companies, the mutual funds, the pension funds are all now covered by stewardship codes, which emphasize ESG. Uh, and I'm curious, as a listed company yourself, what kind of influence do you see these investors exercising uh, in really moving the ESG paradigm forward uh, in our country? You know, I think they do have a role to play. As I mentioned earlier, it's that pull model or the pull demand. Um, 
it's not just them, but it's also our customers, uh, especially overseas, who are demanding that of mm -hmm. their suppliers in countries like India. Um, and so I think it's, a, it's like a, a cascading model of a pull or a pull demand, um, which I think is, is good because I think it will encourage all of us to disclose in a manner that allows uh, everybody to be treated on par and therefore to see where the funds or um, where investment will go. And um, I think also, um, you know, my only question with this is that this is fine with listed companies, but how, what happens to large family businesses which are non-listed, you know, and how do we get them to be part of the whole game? Um, it's a question that I have in mind. And, and many, many family businesses uh, world over are unlisted. So, so with listing, listed companies, this is fine. But ultimately, unless all of us get together and everyone partners with each other uh, to play a role, um, it's not going to happen. So that's, that's a question that lingers in my mind. So actually, let me build on that because uh, I, I assume that there will be some amount of demand and pressure that comes from simply being part of the value chains hmm. of some of the bigger companies. You talked about the pressure that's coming from overseas, for instance, hmm. uh, and of course, regulation and how that regulation extends to all companies, not just listed. So uh, let me take that point forward in the case of Thermax itself. Your annual report says that uh, you have over 2,400 micro, small, and medium enterprises, mm -hmm. MSMEs as suppliers. And of course, the large majority of them will not be listed. Uh, how prepared do you think these kinds of companies, MSMEs, are at this point of time to tackle ESG challenges, particularly the imminent challenge of climate change? And what support do you think these companies will need to really scale up? You know, I think big companies are struggling. So the mm -hmm. littler ones are probably not at all in a position to tackle it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, the trickle effect. I right. mean, unless a customer asks its supplier and they ask their supplier and then their mm -hmm. sub-supplier, you know, so the whole trickle effect, I think it hasn't, I think it really hasn't yet started. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I'm sure it will uh, over time. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, unless we as large companies help in terms of some sort of capability building, some right. sort of policies and processes that we put in when we are selecting a vendor or when we are rating a vendor, right. um, you know, unless that really comes in and it's not again the E only, mm -hmm. it's the E, S and G, just as it is right. for the larger companies. So unless we start looking at these things, um, it's not really going to happen automatically. Having said that, Mukund, I genuinely feel that things like, say, energy efficiency mm -hmm. um, is something that every MSN, every company um, can look at. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think energy efficiency gives you one of the highest returns on investment. Right. And uh, therefore, it doesn't require too much capex, but it gives you a great return. And so if people can start by looking at energy efficiency, uh, which can give them that return on investment, and then move on to other factors, I right. think that would be helpful. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, make, make, makes absolute sense. So you've, you've touched upon the S several times. Let me come to that. Uh, in September 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, uh, your company embarked on what, what it describes as a social compact initiative. Tell us more about this very worthwhile endeavor to support informal workers. Sure. Um, I think it's, it's sad, but it took the pandemic really to highlight uh, what was always there, but it brought it to the surface. Uh, and I think when the lockdown happened in March 2020, and we saw hundreds and thousands of workers start walking back to their villages without food, without money, shelter, um, it really made many of us very sad, seeing these horrible pictures on television 
And so some of us came together and spoke to Dasra, mm -hmm. um, the NGO, and said, can you help us to understand a little more about migrant labor? I'd never really known about migrant labor. And so they organized a series of uh, events on Zoom and invited people, like-minded people, to just come and listen to them speak. And, uh, and then we said, instead of pointing fingers at the government, on anybody else, we need to take responsibility. Uh, and again, take responsibility for the larger ecosystem. So not those that we define as just our employees, mm -hmm. but much beyond that, where we have an influence. Yeah, and we can make a difference. So whether it's on our manufacturing shop floor or at our sites or even with our vendors. So how do we really make a difference over there? And so we decided to start something called the Social Compact. So this was started with uh, a few like-minded uh, industrialists that came together and said, let's begin this. And we said, let's hold ourselves accountable on six outcomes. Um, so the first is living wages instead of just minimum wages. The second is safety, uh, whether it be at our sites, again, on our shop floor, vendors, wherever. The third is health and social security. The fourth is uh, similar pay for similar jobs for both men and women, so gender parity. Um, the fifth is how do we have them get access to government entitlements. You know, like Aadhaar, like your um, health insurance, Ishram, all sorts of things. And the sixth is how do we upskill or reskill uh, this particular labor force, informal labor force. And so it started really with a reflective tool. So um, NGOs like Ajibika Bureau, and Center for Social Justice, people who have been working with informal laborers for years together, they came in and said, let's start with a reflective tool rather than an audit. Okay, mm -hmm. so they, they visited our manufacturing sites, some of our vendors and some of our sites. And um, it was quite revealing in terms of what they came across. I mean, for example, they said that, you know, on your shop floor, you have everything written in, in English. Um, how do you expect your laborers to understand any of it? Or um, at, our, at some of our sites where we have women working, there were no separate toilets for women workers. Now, to be honest, Mukund, I've been to some of my sites. It has never even occurred to me. I mean, I think we've become so thick skin, blase. I don't know what one wants to call it, but it doesn't even occur to people like us that you know that here are women working where do they go to the loo um so so i think it was just these things that really some some contractors don't give appointment letters so people don't even know that they are appointed by this contractor you know where they have some terms and conditions so it just highlighted um some of the issues that in some ways we take for granted and uh, and I think that's where the whole social compact began in terms of how do we really make lives more equitable um, for these people. And so today, I think we have some 40 companies that have signed up to it, which is really a drop in the ocean because there are so many more that we'd like to get to. And this is where I feel that uh, pull will really come in if we can make the S of ESG, this could be really beautiful as part of the S. Today, uh, unfortunately, all of us think that we can do CSR and get away with the S, or we don't have child labor, and so therefore we are complying with S. But uh, I think if we can go a little further and include this part of uh, SOCO um, under the S through, um, maybe through SEBI, through credit rating agencies, you know, move it a little further and help more customers and more industry come in. Uh, make them really believe that a responsible business is a successful business in the long run. So that's Very where we are. Terrific. No, All Poverty, you a fantastic initiative. 
And thank you for the refreshing candor in your answer. I think all of us have been on those journeys and there's so much you discover and there's so much more to be done. Yeah. Absolutely right. So I have another question. Um, this is the second last of my questions and one final one after this. Again, related to employees, uh, certainly the ones on permanent roles and perhaps the ones beyond that. How do you engage them in the company's ESG improvement journey? So for Thermax, ESG in some ways is, is part of our core. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've probably been practicing environment, a little bit of social governance without necessarily calling it ESG. Quite right. And as far as the E part of it is concerned, it's our business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we, we manufacture heating equipment using biomass, different kinds of biomass, waste biomass as fuel um, or solar energy or giving water recycle or using... Um, uh, using a technology instead of reverse osmosis, can we use a technology that makes it uh, more efficient in terms of the wastage of water? So we are constantly looking at ways uh, because that's part of our business model. Um, I remember we had uh, we had a, a discussion at the board about 12, 14 years ago when we wanted to bring in a new business model a build own operate business model mm -hmm. and uh, and many on the board said uh, yeah you can sell steam but include coal it's okay you know whatever brings you a quick return on investment mm -hmm. and i remember some of us mentioning no uh, let's make it green let's keep it as green steam um and i'm really happy that we stuck to our guns uh, because even though you don't get a high return, especially initially, I'm, I'm happy that we're doing something for the planet. And in some ways, it also sends a strong message down the line with regard to employees that we mean business. You know, so, so I think that's uh, on the, we are also looking in ter terms of environment on how do we do energy transition for our customers? Mm -hmm. You know, so so all our employees are involved in coming up with products that help customers transition in terms of their energy. And, and so, as I say, it's really part of our core business. So, in fact, if we don't do it, we will perish. <laughs> so, so we had better look at it uh, uh, very strongly. And, of course, on the S side, as I mentioned, social compact. But... Um, social compact is not just something that is like a malam patti, you know, that is just mm -hmm. like on, from the outside. Mm -hmm. It has to be, it's now bought in by the board and the MD and the senior management, trickling down now slowly within the organization such that every person in the organization, whether it be your procurement head or whether it be somebody at site or your head of manufacturing, whoever it be, you know, really believes in it and makes it happen. So, so we are trying to make SOCO very much a part of business as usual, because unless that happens, it won't be sustainable. Right. You know, right. and of right. course the governance part of it, I would say really, I think uh, thanks to my grandfather, my father, um, it's been very strong within the organization right from the start. Uh, my father always believed that profit is not just a set of figures, but of values. And so mm -hmm. the kind of values that, uh, that he, my mom believing that business cannot survive in a society that fails. And mm -hmm. so doing a lot for society. So all those have really been sort of uh, cornerstones of mm -hmm. uh, the kind of culture and the values uh, that we've got within Thermax. And uh, maybe one last thing I, I read somewhere and I love the saying, saying that uh, business has to be based on growth and profits or else it will die. But if business is based solely on growth and profits, then also it shall die for it no longer has a reason for its existence. And, and I think that's so true. Uh, we can't just depend on the top and bottom line today. Today, business is really about being responsible. Right, 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 right. So my last question, Mayor, you talked about uh, the way in which the employees 
bring into the company the voice of the customer and obviously that requires a lot of innovation. <coughs> so my final question today is in the quest for ESG improvement, how relevant is R&D spending in particular for Indian businesses and within your own firm, you know, the typical issue we hear about is a trade-off between seeing it as a cost mm -hmm. and really creating opportunities. Some of them may be in the long term only for additional margin creation through the investments in R&D. So how important is this for Thermax? Uh, as I mentioned, Mukund, this is really our core. Mm. Um, so in fact, R&D, uh, engineering, manufacturing solutions that help in terms of the transition of energy for ourselves as well as for our customers. That's our business. And so R&D plays a huge role in it. Um, I mean, starting with 50 years ago, 55 years ago, when we started the company and building it to where it is today. Um, earlier on, I think coal as a, as a fuel was about 50% of our top line. Today, it's probably less than 15% or, or even lower than that. And uh, this constant move towards green uh, is something that we are constantly asking ourselves and uh, partnering with customers to make this happen. Because unless we partner with say a steel manufacturer or a cement manufacturer and see how their technology is changing rapidly, we will not be able to be of value to them. So we have to partner each other very strongly in today's day and age in order to make this happen. And talking about uh, investment today for a longer term profit, 100%. I mean, again, part of our business model, um, whether it was with the Greens team that I spoke about a little earlier, um, we decided to go along with it irrespective of the fact that it wouldn't add to our top and bottom line initially, because 10 and 15 years ago, people were still not wanting to make that move. You know, that move has really started in the last few years. Uh, or even, um, I would say, SOCO. SOCO is an investment today, um, hopefully for something that benefits humanity, but also benefits the company long term. So, so I think uh, I, I really feel that uh, a responsible business uh, is a successful business in the long run. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Merit. That's about all the time we have today. The ESG landscape is changing swiftly. And as we heard from Meher, this offers many ways in which forward-looking businesses, including small and medium enterprises, can leverage their capabilities to shape the market and listening to the voice of the customer gain competitive advantage. And certainly business as usual is not going to be an option going forward. There will be a clear reset thanks to the new ESG paradigm. Uh, we will have to leave it there, I'm afraid, but thank you so much, Mayor, for your time. Thanks, The Mokhi. passion you bring, I think, is, is, is so obvious. It's been <laughs> wonderful. And it's clear that you enjoy what you do, so it's uh, fantastic to see. So thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for being Mokhi. in the program. And thank you, viewers, and goodbye for now.